When I was a very young associate minister at this church, and in the first few months that I was here, I was intoxicated with the excitement of the spiritual journey of so many people that is so common in this great marble collegiate congregation. It was an exciting time in my life. And one of the most inspiring things to me was the activity of young people and the seriousness of their spiritual search, the journey that they were on. And a phrase that I would continuously hear from them, I'm seeking God's will, God's will for my life is, and they would spell it out, telling wonderful stories about how things were going for them. And I was so taken in by all of this excitement about God's will that I was sure that in a very short period of time, I would be discovering a formula for discerning God's will. One afternoon, I had an appointment with a young woman who was vibrant and excited and self-assured, and she was telling me all the wonderful things that God was doing in her life. And then she said a couple days before, she heard distinctly the voice of God say that you are to marry a particular young man. She said, God wills for me to marry that man. I celebrated her joy and excitement with her, and we went on. That night, after a meeting at which there were a number of young people, another young woman pulled me off to the corner and said, Arthur, she too was self-assured and excited about the things God was doing in her life. And she said, Arthur, I'm feeling very strongly that God's will for me is to marry a particular young man. And she named the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of them married the man. And I knew that God was not the one who was confused. And very quickly I gave up my naive dream that I was going to find a formula for discerning God's will in my life. And discerning God's will is one of the great challenges of anybody's life, whether they're spiritual or not. Because I'm sure that awareness exists in every human being. And so, where do we go? What do we do to discern what God's will is for us in the way we live our lives? And in one dimension, it's relatively simple. We look to the scriptures. And the scriptures are what I call the wisdom of the universe. The great wisdom of the ages. It's all in the Holy Scripture. It's all there. And if you can distill it all and put it into one sentence, this is what God wills for us. God wills for each one of us that we always take the high road. That we always try to see things and behave according to the highest point of view. And what are some of the specifics? We go to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, and we read the Ten Commandments, some of which are, love God God is first. Honor the Sabbath. <laughs> if anything we have done wrong in, in our lives, in our Christian lives, in society, we have not honored the Sabbath. And that's a shame because we need it spiritually, we need it emotionally, we need it mentally, we need it physically. We need the day apart. And in the creation story, did not God say, and labored for six days, and on the seventh God rested, took a day apart. What are some other commandments? Honor your mother and your father. Do not take another person's life. Do not steal. Do not lie. These are some of the commandments. These are things that help us take the high road in the situations, the circumstances, the challenges of our lives. And then we go to the prophet Micah, who said some extraordinary things in just a few words. What is good? What does the Lord require of thee, O mortal? And he gives these words. To do justice. To love kindness. To walk humbly with your God. That says it all, doesn't it? That's the high road. And then we go to the New Testament. What does the New Testament say? If we pulled it all into one or two or three words, we would say love, or two words, a forgiving love. 
So that in every challenge, every circumstance, every difficulty we find ourselves in, what is God's will for me? What is God's will for you? To take the high road. A number of years ago, I was asked to speak at the Rotary Club of Kansas City, which was a large, very active and influential club. And that particular day, they were giving an honor to a man named Ewing Kaufman, who just a few years ago has died. Ewing Kaufman was Mr. Kansas City, the most civic-minded man in that community, did so much for that Kansas City. He founded the Marion Drug Company, which he told me he started in the garage of his house after the Second World War and built this great big conglomerate and did a wonderful thing. Strange thing about Kaufman, he was a diamond in the rough character if you ever saw him, he was ruddy complexion, outspoken, very blunt, very factual, very, very much a, a nice guy, the guy next door. Anyway, as we were talking during lunch, he said, you see that table down there? We were on the dais and there was a table down there with 10 men in it. He said, you see those 10 men, they all work for me. And every single one of them is a millionaire. Can you believe that? These guys made a million dollars working for me. And he was very proud of it. Then he said, in the next five years, there are going to be 30 millionaires working for me. And I never heard an owner or a CEO talk boast about what his employees were making, what kind of money they were making. Usually it's that cost too much money. They're too expensive. I don't want to give them this or that. But he was so proud of this. And then he said this. He said, Arthur. I run my company by the Bible. They don't know that, but I run it by the Bible. If they thought I was preaching from the Bible, they wouldn't listen to me, but this is what I tell them to do. Everyone who works for me has to treat every other person as they want to be treated. He said the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And then he said, Arthur, it works. It really works. And it does. And I was preparing these remarks for this morning. I was thinking about myself and the behavior that I showed in three or four situations this past week where I didn't measure up to the golden rule. And how difficult it is to be in a situation where if I was in the reverse, how would I want that person to treat me? And it's a real challenge and a real test. But Ewing Kaufman was right. It works. It really works. Then there's a phrase I heard a lot as a child. And some of you of my generation probably were familiar with the same phrase. In fact, it was so important to somebody in my Sunday school that I attended as a child that they had it done in calligraphy, framed and put on a Sunday school wall. And it went like this. What would Jesus say? And I had mixed feelings about that. There was a part of me that wanted to hear what Jesus would say, but there was a part of it I was, somebody was pointing their finger at me, Arthur, you're being a bad boy, what would Jesus say now? And it was, it was in a negative. And so I dismissed that phrase for years and years and years. But it's a good question. In the situation that you're dealing with, when you're seeking to find out what is the best right thing for me to do, what might God's will be for me in this circumstance? You ask the question, what would Jesus say? And my guess is that you, as I, would get a pretty good answer. Let me come through this in another way. That in every circumstance that we're in, that we seek to be a blessing. That we bring a positive spirit. That we bring something good into the situation. Not only being gentle and kind and embracing and encouraging, but sometimes we have encounters where we have to confront somebody. A boss is going to have to say something unpleasant to an employee. But there are good ways of saying it. And saying things in such a way that the person feels blessed. That they're helped by the exchange. And if it doesn't help in the specific way that we want, at least they will appreciate the attitude that we have. That we're trying to live out the golden rule, treating them as we would want to be treated. Taking the high road. A woman in this congregation gave me permission to tell this story. I will not use her name. But she was having a very difficult time this week, meeting a challenge beyond which most of us would ever have to meet. And she was in a discouraged and downtrodden and if not depressed state. She said she was in her doctor's office and he was recommending to her a piece of equipment that she should use 
that would help her in her therapy to get better with an illness that she was dealing with. And he said, but it's very expensive and you better check with your insurance company first. And she said, what's well, expensive? And he gave her a figure and it was expensive. And she said, it's important enough to me that I'm going to find a way to raise this money. And the doctor said, you know, the manufacturer's representative is in the office area. I want you to talk to him today. And so this woman met a man named Richie. She said he was very young, probably in his early 20s, maybe the very first job he had after college. And he had this a piece of equipment. And Richie heard my story, she said, and he said, look, I'll tell you what. I will help you apply for the insurance. If the insurance doesn't come through, I'll give it to you, no charge. And then he said, do you have a, a doorman in your building? And she said, yes. He said, I'll deliver it tomorrow, which he did. Now, the man's name was Richie. She asked the man for his card, and she expected this on the card to be Richard so-and-so and so-and-so. But it was signed, just put it was just the name there, Richie. And she said, how come you use Richie on your card? He said, I'm too young to be a Richard and we're not wise enough. <laughs> so when the equipment the next day was delivered, she called him. And she said, Richie, thank you so much. You've done a wonderful thing for me. And he said, no, no, I was just doing my job. And she said, Richie, most people don't do their job as you're doing that job. I need you to know something. You did for me something very, very special. I will always appreciate it. And then she hung up. But what she said to me was that this man was my angel. She said, I was down in the depths and I needed something. And this man was a blessing to me. God's will is for us to do what we can do to be a blessing. I don't know anything about Richie's background, whether he's Christian, whether he knows anything about Jesus or what. But he, what he was doing was doing God's will in his life by being a blessing to somebody who was a stranger. A couple of weeks ago, I was having some kind of medical test, and the young woman who was giving the test probably was in her middle 20s. And I noticed on her name tag, her name was, last name was Deacon. And I said, what nationality is that? She said, I'm English. She said, well, my mother was Italian. I don't know why she said that, except that my name was an Italian name. And I didn't ask her, have you ever been to England? I said, have you ever been to Italy? I don't know why I would have do it that way. But anyway, you've ever been to Italy? She said many times. Then she described a trip that her, she and her family had on a cruise ship which had several Italian ports, Mediterranean, ending up in Egypt. And she said, believe it or not, when we were being oriented to the ship, we were given a little booklet about the protocol of behavior on ship. And she said there was a section there, dumb questions Americans ask. <laughs> and she said, you'd be surprised at how dumb some Americans can be when they travel, the questions they ask. And she said one of the featured nights on the cruise was a night where the chefs in the kitchen did an ice sculpture. And one of the questions invariably American asks is, what do you do with a sculpture after you're finished with it? <laughs> it'll take a while, it'll take a while. And then she told me of her sister, who was a concierge in a hotel in Las Vegas. And somebody called one day and she said, I can't find my way out of my room. And she said, what do you mean you can't find your way out of your room? Did you try the door? She said, there are three doors here. There's a bathroom door, the closet door, and a door that says, do not disturb. <laughs> I laughed. I laughed. And what this technician did for me because I was, I was in a low spot. But she, whether she knew it or not, was a blessing. She was living out God's will in that moment by bringing some cheer to me. God has a way of interceding in our lives. God has a way of presenting God's self at times when we need God. And the English spiritual writer Evelyn Underhill said, God's power comes into action just where our power fails. God's power, think of this now, comes into action just where our action fails. And this is the way God in acts lives out God's will in our lives. And something else that Evelyn Underhill said in telling the story 
of what happens in the spiritual journey. And she said, the more we're on the spiritual path, the more we discover that a strange power of spirit over circumstance. The strange power of spirit over circumstance. And you know, you and I think we're in charge. We think that we are responsible for everything that happens in our lives. We are not in charge. Please know that. But we are responsible. We're responsible for the way we respond to things, for our attitudes, for the way we handle ourselves. We're responsible for making the decision, say, of taking the high road, finding God's will through the high road. But that's as far as it goes. We are not in charge. God is in charge and does what God does when God needs to do what God does. And God's will so many times is enacted in small, subtle ways, but in large and dramatic ways. And I finish with a story that was told by Dr. Carl Jung, the great behavioral psychologist. One of the great minds of the last two or three hundred years as he understood human nature. And Carl Jung, as you know, was a deeply spiritual man, not traditional Christian in the way that we know, but a deeply spiritual man. Somebody said to him, Dr. Jung, do you believe in God? He said, no, I don't believe in God. He said, I know God. And that's on a whole different level. It tells a story of God's involvement, God's intercession in a particular life. There was a soldier named Johnny who was in the United States Army during the Second World War, stationed on one of the rim islands of the Pacific, getting close to the invasion of Japan. And one night, as he was lying in his tent, he heard very clearly the words, Johnny! Johnny! It was his mother's voice, just as clear as if she was outside the tent. Johnny! Johnny! He thought some bored soldier friend of his was a prankster and was playing a joke on him. Couldn't get the Johnny, Johnny out of his mind. So he got out of the tent, looked around, but couldn't find anybody. But somebody had to have said, repeated what his mother was saying. Johnny, Johnny. He walked and walked and walked around the outside of the campgrounds. Couldn't find anybody. Went back to his tent. And when he got there, he found a gaping hole with smoke where a Japanese mortar shell had landed on his tent while he was out looking for somebody who he thought was a prankster. A few months later, the war was over. He went home to Oklahoma, was telling his mother this story. And her ears perked up, and she said, Johnny, let's, let's check some days. Let's check some times. They, they chose, I mean, they agreed on what day it was, what time of the day it was. And she said, let me tell you my part of the story. She said, I had a dream. It was a nightmare. It was vivid. It was powerful that you were being attacked and the tent in which you were lying was struck by enemy mortar shell. And I cried out, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. And your father woke me up from the nightmare and said, no, you're just dreaming, you're just dreaming. Johnny's in, in the Pacific. We're here. It was a bad dream. And it wasn't a bad dream. It was, yes, it was a nightmare. But somehow, God in God's extraordinary, mysterious way the way that God behaves with us, the way God intercedes, the way God does what God wants to do, the way God enacts God's will with us, is there in that moment for that young man. What does the story tell? God is in charge. The power of spirit over circumstances. How do you find God's will? Well, you know through the scriptures. You take the high road. And then you know one other thing, that you are not in charge. That God does what God is doing when God wants to do it. And know this about God beyond anything else. God always is faithful. Let us pray. Lord, for the blessings of our lives, for your presence, your guidance, your challenge, we give you thanks. Be with us all now, Lord, to discern your will. Help us. Continue thy faithfulness. Amen.